Thank you. Yes, look, I'd like to just take the opportunity to report on some recent advances we've made in uh, our understanding of how marine reserves uh, work. And uh, in giving this talk, I'd like to especially acknowledge uh, Hugo and uh, Dave as part of the team here that have helped make this uh, work happen. Look, I think it's fair to say that we can take the benefits of marine reserves within their boundaries. Uh, there's plenty of evidence for that. Uh, bigger fish inside the boundaries, uh, more fish and so on. Uh, our research is really concerned with uh, looking for what the potential benefits might be beyond boundaries, particularly for uh, uh, exploited species uh, in, uh, in, in terms of helping sustain uh, fisher fisheries. And, uh, and so essentially it's all about where do the baby fish go. Uh, yeah, look, the essential problem that we have with reefs is they're, they're naturally fragmented, seemingly, seemingly kind of disconnected habitats. And uh, we really need to know whether or not we're kind of dealing with lots and lots of little populations that are sort of behaving independently, uh, they're separated from one another on these reefs um, at, at the one extreme, or are we essentially dealing with one big uh, population that's uh, connected and we think if it is connected like that and all operating as one big population it's through larval dispersal. Uh, I think it's fair to say that our, our uh, progress on this has been very slow and incremental. When I first started uh, working on reef fishes it was about 25 years ago and we tended to focus on little individual reefs and we tended to look at the interactions between uh, uh, individuals, and we very soon found out that a lot of the effects of those interactions were actually influencing reproduction and, and, uh, and uh, the numbers of eggs that produce. So we couldn't really go any further with that unless we could kind of figure out where the larvae go. Doesn't like to go back this thing. Um, at the same time, we, we kind of had this realisation that very often the populations on these reefs were actually being not limited by those interactions, but limited by the supply of larvae coming onto them. So we, we couldn't really go any further with that until we actually figured out where larvae came from. And uh, yeah, we kind of developed an assumption about how these populations operate in terms of uh, uh, widespread larval dispersal, essentially in a down current uh, direction and so that uh, the, the populations are connected over very big uh, distances but when you think we look back on this we didn't really have a huge amount of solid evidence that this was the way things were happening. Uh, over the last 10 to 15 years of course there was this accumulating evidence um, based on a number of things, larval tagging studies, uh, otolith chemistry, you know there was a lot of stuff coming out to suggest a lot of the juveniles were actually making it back to the natal uh, reefs. But it was never all of them. You know, there was a, you know, I did a recent review of this and, and it could be anywhere between 10% to 90%, but it's always some making it back to the um, to their natal reefs. So we, we ended up with, now with this kind of really quite probably more realistic but complex picture of how these op populations are operating. Some self-recruitment, some dispersal probably between adjacent reefs and then probably a bit of long distance dispersal. And we're, we're now trying to put a lot of effort, effort into trying to figure out the relative importance of these things to replace those question marks there with some uh, numbers. Of course the impetus, you know, the motivation now is to try and understand how these marine reserve networks uh, actually work because we really need to know you know, how these uh, green zones or protected, no-take marine protected areas actually interact with the adjacent fished areas and, of course, whether or not they're actually connected to each other in some kind of way. Uh, and so it boils down to these, I think, critical questions. How much are individual reserves uh, self-replenishing? Because that'll tell us a little bit about whether or not an individual reserve can function as a sanctuary of some sort for a fish. Of course, the $64 million question, just how many of the larvae from, from reserves are heading out to, and help into the fished areas and are going to help us sustain those, fished, uh, those fisheries, and if so, how much of that are we getting? And uh, then finally, 
um, you know, are the reserves actually functioning as a network? How much exchange are we getting between our protected populations? Because we'd really like to have a bit of that happening as well. And of course, if if they're all doing one of these things, they can't be doing any of the others. So um, it's important to sort of know the proportions that are doing these kinds of things in a marine reserve uh, setup. So we, we wanted to answer this question for the Great Barrier Reef, or at least part of the Green Zone network. Um, the thing with the, the GBR, of course, is it's the, there's a lot of green zones. Uh, they're very close together. I think the average distance between two green zones is something like 10 to 15 kilometres. So we needed to come up with a technique that could examine connectivity at a small spatial scale. And so we settled on parentage analysis. Now, parentage analysis is really about just matching juvenile DNA to the parents. So the idea is that you're going to sample a population of adults, get as much DNA as you can, uh, and then sample juveniles and try to, to, to classify them back to where their parents are. And um, it's a good technique if you can do it because you're going to get an individual dispersal distance. You're going to know where the juvenile is, where the parents were, and you'll get, a, get an effective dispersal distance. But you, you need to fin clip a large number of adults. You've got to sample a big proportion of the adult population. You've got to sample a lot of microsatellites to confidently um, be able to uh, assign juveniles to their parents. And uh, proof of concept, we played around this with this with uh, clownfish. Now the question that we often get asked with this is how confident can you be that you can assign juveniles, you know, do you, are you going to make mistakes in these assignments? Now, Luckily, we've come up with an alternative way to actually tag larvae and to actually cross-validate these techniques. Um, so the technique we use is we basically inject, it's the magic element, barium, uh, uh, inject trace amounts of that, that into the female and then she passes that on to all her eggs and it gets into the odorless of the developing offspring and it is a really, really effective way to, to tag these, these fishes. Uh, we did this work on Nemo at Kimby Island Reserve in Kimby Bay that we've heard just a little bit about. And uh, it's a very uh, small island here, just about a, a kilometre or two around. And we know all the individuals of this clownfish on that island. We don't, haven't actually given them names, but we, we know them from their DNA. And, uh, you know, there's 253 pairs here. Uh, and look, over several years now, like I'm talking uh, four or five years, We've consistently found about 40 to 60 percent of the recruitment on that little island is self-recruitment. That means 40 to 60 percent of the juveniles that we see turning up there are actually from parents on that island. And we're also actually tracing them now, babies that have come from here over to the little reefs uh, surrounding some of the other islands in the bay. The, the point of just showing this here was to just say, well, how, how does the barium and the the uh, parentage compare, and really well. So uh, basically when we uh, assign juveniles to parents, they are usually barium tagged as well, or if we don't assign them, then uh, not barium. Um, in no case have we had like one that we've had a categorical barium mark that we haven't, been, haven't signed them juveniles to parents using the genetic technique as well. So uh, we, don't th we think the parentage is really good. Um, the, occasionally the barium doesn't get in, so sometimes you will actually have a juvenile, we've assigned it to parents, um, but we didn't actually tag it. This talk is not meant to be about clownfish, so uh, we, we, we decided that the technique is so good we've got to try it for some real reef fish. Uh, we're going to look at stripies and uh, coral trout, and we wanted to do this on the... Uh, Great Barrier Reef to see whether or not we could apply this to look at the effectiveness of, of green zones. And so we went down to the Keppel Islands where these two species are an important part of the recreational uh, fishery. And one of the other good reasons that we chose them is that we know the green zones down there are working very well. So we've got roughly twice as many... We've got roughly twice as many... Uh, individuals in the green zones per unit area compared to the blues. So we've got lots more adults in there. Where are their babies going? This was our experimental design. 
Uh, we went into there, basically the idea was to sample as many adults as we could in three small green zones, one out here, um, and then sample juveniles and try to assign the juveniles back to, and, and work out how many are actually coming back to the same green zone, how many of the juveniles are dispersing out into blue zones, which is uh, what was the big question, and also if there's any connectivity between those uh, green zones. And uh, it involved really a huge exercise of rec basically going into those green zones with catching fish with barbless hooks. We had a huge number of volunteers and boats, and we did this over two two-week periods during the spawning season, and tagged the fish, fin clipped them for the DNA, and we even did the barium kind of experiment there as well. Um, yeah, stripy snapper, we caught something like 1,300, but um, our underwater visual survey suggested that was roughly 42% of the adults in those three uh, green zones. Um, and that's actually one of the th things that sticks in my mind has come out of this work is just actually how few adult fish there can be in some of these green zones. Uh, the bar cheek coral trout here, we caught 404, but that was about 29% of the population. Uh, and then, of course, we raced around collecting recruits from, from blue zones, green zones, everywhere we could find them, in fact, in the Keppel Island group, and we got uh, close to 500 of both the two species for uh, juveniles. I'll get to the results soon. Um, I won't say much about the analysis except to say we've applied uh, lots of microsatellites and we've got a very, very high um, probability of actually excluding the individuals that are not parents, so we're pretty happy we've got um, as good assignments as we're getting with the uh, clownfish. Uh, this is the work that uh, Hugo did. Uh, and look, here's the results for stripies. We managed to assign 69 of those juveniles to parents that we had sampled in those green zones. Um, the green zones account for something like 90% of the area, but when you make the adjustment for the fact that we didn't sample all the adults, those green zones look like they could be explaining something like 34% of the regional recruitment um, in that area. And uh, for stripies, uh, for the coral trout, we also made a huge number of assignments, um, many more than we were expecting to. Um, and here it works out that could be, you know, those three little green zones, 19% of the area, are making a pretty disproportional contribution to the recruitment in that, that place. Okay, look, here are, where do the larvae go? Here are our traces of where we found, we are basically connecting the juveniles back to the places where their parents were. You can see for stripies here, we've got a small number of uh, juveniles that have actually come back to the same green little green zone as their, their parents has su surprised us because these are actually pretty small green zones. Um, you know, some of them, you know, th uh, two or three hundred metres uh, across. Uh, but this is, uh, this is the nice bit. Something like 54% of the offspring of this species actually went out of those green zones and settled in the blue zones uh, in the Keppel Islands region. They pretty much went everywhere in the Keppel's uh, region. Um, and uh, you can sort of see a lot of them coming from down here to up here. We've got egg rock sending juveniles into the Keppel Island region um, as well. So this is 54% of the known juveniles and the ones that we've assigned, over half of them um, have moved from green to blue. And uh, we've got a little, a small number actually going from green to green for the species, something like 20% or so. Uh, same for coral trout, although we've got a little bit less self-recruitment. We've got um, a lot more. We've got now here for coral trout, we've got 83% of the juveniles that we've actually assigned back to parents have been ones that have gone from those three green zones into blue zones in the, or fished areas in the general area of the Keppel Islands. Um, you can see, again, some consistent features like um, a, an awful amount of retention, or a lot of retention in this kind of area. That happened for both. Um, and Egg Rock is an amazing place because it's one of these reserves that's quite old. There's a lot of really big coral trout there, and it's clearly an important place for supplying juveniles into, um, into the Keppel Islands area. We just simply have not had that kind of information uh, before and it suggests that, certainly suggests that these uh, green zones are making a contribution to the fishery. 
I'll be very quick. And there's some um, uh, do, uh, do green zones exchange larvae. Yeah, we've got a little bit of evidence for for uh, uh, juveniles actually dispersing from one green zone to another. And uh, broad, I, don't, I don't want to say too much about currents here, but there is a little bit of a pattern of things tending to go in the direction of the of the currents in this area. Uh, so there's a summary of that data you can see. And basically, I just want to make the point that we can get all of these sort of outcomes to a degree um, uh, from these green zones. We're getting some retention or, or self-recruitment within an individual green zone. It might be a sanctuary. We're getting a, a lot over half of the juveniles are going out to help with the fishery. And there, there's also a certain proportion that are going from one green zone to another. And I imagine that if you changed the spacing or size of these things, you could manipulate that any way you wanted to go um, with that. Um, and, and another couple of quick calculations here. I, I just wanted to turn this around and say, look, can we make an estimate of actually where do the juveniles that are turning up in the blue zones and the green zones, how many of the juveniles have, have actually come from the green zones in this area? Um, and if you do make an adjustment there and you adjust for the fact that actually the green zones down there account for 32% of the area, that 32% seems to be contributing over, for stripies, over 50% of the recruitment that's happening in the uh, blue zones and perhaps as much as 72% of the recruitment in the green zones. And for coral trout, it's... It's quite amazing. Uh, when you do that calculation, um, you know, we sampled only 26% of the adults in the 19% area, which is the green zones. We do, we multiply it up. It's really, it could be that uh, this 32% of the reef areas are actually contributing to, in this case, I don't know, 80 to 90% of the, of the recruitment. Whether or not that figure actually turns out to be correct or not, it's really looking like these reserves are punching above their weight. They really are contributing a, 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 a differential amount of the recruitment that's happening in the area. Um, I'm probably running out of time. I just, although I've, been, I've mentioned a couple of differences between those two species, if you actually just plot the known dispersal trajectories that we have, uh, or the dispersal frequency distribution for stripies and coral trout, they're not all that different. Um, you know, we're getting a lot of settlement within one or two kilometres, and these kind of peaks, they just seem to relate to the distance between the spawning areas and the good recruitment areas um, in uh, the Keppel region. And our, our job really at the moment now is, because we've had this sort of success here, we really just want to see how far we can push that scale out in terms of tracking these... Uh, uh, I'll finish there, just the emerging picture. Um, it's obviously looking like there's a fair amount of regional recruitment there. Um, a lot's settling locally, just how far this dispersal curve goes out, we're going to try and answer in our next, next uh, uh, endeavours. Um, but yeah, it's looked like green zones can be self-sustaining, they can contribute to sustainable fishing, and they can be contributing to a, a kind of a network and uh, all of those things seem to be happening, um, which is good. The other thing I wanted to say was they're also making a disproportionate contribution to the recruitment, and that seems to be on a sort of a 20 kilometre, 10, 20, maybe less than 30 kilometre scale. So, uh, in other words, the local people, the people in that area are actually benefiting from uh, looking after their own green zones and, uh, and, and complying with the, the protection there, there, there will be direct benefits for them. And uh, yeah, maybe parentage analysis is showing up to be a way to go to perhaps answer some of these questions. It, it won't work for all species, but um, we're starting to get a bit of a list now of species that it, we can get some connectivity data for. Thank you.